As the father of five children who are in various stages of the educational process from undergraduate on up to doctorate level, I have a vested interest in our education system. Today, I'm going to speak to Stephen Hollowell to find out how AWS is helping to make college students, researchers, and IT professionals more productive. Later in the show, Jeff, I'm going to take you to school, and I'll be speaking with Steve McPherson about the public data sets available through Amazon Web Services. Tell me a bit about what you do for AWS. Sure, so uh, I run AWS's uh, education and state and local government uh, sales and customer engagement division in the United States. I have uh, a, a great team of uh, both sales resources as well as solution architects uh, and some business development folks as well. Let's start by talking about education. What's the attraction of AWS to education? Education is uh, going through a lot of transformations now. Uh, there have been several themes that have occurred in the national and international news regarding education over the past year, uh, whether that is uh, the teaching to the test uh, and some of the issues folks have with that, uh, some of the issues with tuition and the rising cost of tuition, uh, or th this digital divide that folks talk about where uh, folks are trying to connect the, the learning with the proper students and, and uh, improving education outcomes for everybody. Uh, the challenge is that uh, information technology is sometimes part of that divide. Uh, and there's a vicious cycle that can happen where the rich or the well-funded schools, school districts, can get access to information technology as they need it. They can create education outcomes for their students that are very different from the less well-funded schools. So this is not simply teaching about AWS. This is using AWS in a very, very broad sense to bring all different kinds of subjects to, to the students. Yeah, that's, that's what's exciting about it, is that we get to focus on the technology. We get to, to work with customers on AWS and their applications. But the connection is really to the, to the, the business processes of teaching. And whether that is the classroom itself, or administrative workloads, websites, portals, the learning management systems, uh, or some of the really cool innovative things that are happening like um, what's called MOOCs or Massive Open Online Courseware. Uh, we get to, to ride along with some of those innovations and see customers use AWS to change the education business model. What kind of successes are we seeing? Are, are there specific schools or customers we could talk about? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we, we are uh, really fortunate to have great successes with some of the MOOCs, and, and by name, Coursera uses AWS. Uh, and we've also had great success with different types of new uh, education companies like Newton, K-N-E-W-T-O-N, -E uh, and the folks that are working using big data and machine learning to provide an adaptive experience for students where they're seeing what's working and what's not working in the classroom and providing that information back to the teacher and the education content provider as the course is progressing. We have some specific programs for helping out schools of various yeah. sorts. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So we have, uh, right now today, we have an educator program where if a professor or a teacher in the K-12 uh, world wants to teach a class using AWS or about AWS, they can apply on our grants page. Uh, it's a very quick turnaround. They simply write uh, a text field and tell us a little bit about themselves and the course they want to teach. And we will create an in-kind donation of AWS uh, credits uh, and allow that uh, professor to teach a class. And, and we basically pick up the cost for that infrastructure. We'll be right back with part two of my interview with Stephen Hallowell. Let's check in with Lee and see how he's doing. I'm joined today by Steve McPherson of Amazon Elastic MapReduce, and we're going to be talking about the public data sets. Thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, no problem. So tell me, what exactly are the public data sets? The public data sets are a repository of public domain data that we make easily available to AWS customers, uh, especially through services like EC2, um, Elastic Block Store uh, mounts, and then also through S3 with services like Elastic MapReduce. What kind of data is available in the, in the, in the public data sets? There, there are many kinds of data. For example, we have the, uh, the Marvel comic universe, uh, a graph of, of data of, of Marvel characters. But uh, there's also uh, some very, uh, very large, very meaningful data sets like the Thousand Genome Project, which has um, a survey of 1,700 humans genome information. And uh, these data sets are very large. Like that, and, uh, uh, that one, actually, I think that's 200 terabytes of data, the, the wow. common crawl data. 
uh, another very large data set is 81 terabytes. So wow. you can see that these, uh, these data sets would be very difficult for people to shuttle into their system right. on their own. Um, and because it's available freely on uh, S3, those ones are, um, it makes it very easy for people to pull into EC2 or through Elastic MapReduce and have direct access to those and do processing against them. Is it, is it fairly easy to work with this data? Sometimes, uh, not always, because there's a, there is a diversity of data formats. Um, in the case of uh, the Common Crawl, we have very extensive libraries, actually the common crawl, uh, uh, org. Um They have built very extensive uh, sample code to help people uh, consume it through Elastic MapReduce. Um, many of the data sets, uh, like the Million Song uh, data set, uh -huh. that um, has tutorials and has data that, uh, instructions that go along with it. Because the data is in many domains, uh, there isn't necessarily a standard format for all of them, so we take full advantage of different AWS services, be it uh, uh, mounts uh, to pull up an image and then you would restore to a PostgreSQL database or um, you know, directly accessing via EMR, Got it. Uh, which I'm a big fan of, obviously, because obviously. that's my gig. Well, thanks so much for your time. Hopefully some of our developers who are watching are going to go and play with some of these data sets. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. We're back with part two of my interview with Stephen Hallowell. Tell me a bit about the state and local government part of your job as well. Sure. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of movement in state and local government around containing their costs or reducing their costs. Uh, and although state and local government budgets are improving this year over last, uh, there certainly has been a, a number of years where those budgets are, have been under uh, a lot of scrutiny and, and a lot of requirement to reduce. We're seeing state and local governments do some really innovative things to meet that government or that budget challenge. Uh, one of those, for instance, is shared services. So Douglas County, uh, Nebraska, is actually creating an infrastructure that they can use that, that creates a lower cost for themselves to run infrastructure. But the innovative part is they're allowing other counties to leverage that same infrastructure. The reason this couldn't be done before was because nobody can go out and buy the amount of servers that might require you know, five or six different counties to, to use ahead of time. Douglas County doesn't need to do that with their AWS cloud model. They can simply provision those instances as they need them and scale their model up and down as required. That is actually really interesting. So you talked about the, the county really becoming effectively a service provider mm -hmm. and then being able to scale and then accommodate other counties. Is that a, do you think yeah. that's the beginning of a trend that you'll see more and more of? A absolutely. I'll give you a, a different example, but it's, it's, it's a great one. Uh, the city of Austin had some issues with, uh, strangely enough, finding out where the potholes are. It's a, a, an issue all citizens are very tuned into. Uh, and they had gotten a traditional quote from a large IT vendor that said, we'll put sensors in your buses, maybe in your police cars. And it was a very large amount of money they were quoted. And then this little company came along and said, why don't we write an app for the iPhone and for Android phones? Citizens can choose to download it, install it, click on the security and privacy rights that allow them to share the data directly with the city. And when that accelerometer in that phone goes up and down, um, and is reported several hundred thousand times a day at the exact same latitude and longitude, the city's gained some really valuable information using uh, its best resource, those citizens that live there and move around the city. And that application was created in weeks, not months, and, and put together for tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and is really a great example of, of city government or municipal government innovating using the cloud and accelerating their, their rate of change. This has been really interesting, and I, I certainly appreciate your taking the time to come and, and speak with us today, and uh, look forward to hearing more in the future. Look forward to coming back. Thanks. Thank you so much. This has been the AWS Report, and I'm Jeff Barr. You can follow me on Twitter, read my blog, send me a comment, and follow along. Thanks for watching.